one thing I just want to mention right off the gate is that, um, you know, Debt Collective, right, and the debt, this debt organizing has produ is really producing some concrete results, including organizing the nation's first student debt strike, which has won over a billion dollars in debt abolition to date and generated a piece of proposed federal legislation, which is college for all, right? So I want to be really clear, you know, we're going to get into some territory that's going to talk, that's going to talk about what debt means, and that might feel abstract, but this movement is very concrete, and the wins that are on the table of being concrete and the wins we can get are even more. So with that, let's go into it. Let's start out with just this, like, let's start out really basic if we can, right? Because I know there's a lot of people who are just like, okay, yeah, I don't like paying debt, but let's just get really into the foundations. Why is it important for us to organize around debt? Yeah, I think, you know, there's so much to say about debt because once you get into it, it's such a rich, territory. It's rich philosophically, right? There's like all of this morality, um, all of this history to unpack. Um, uh, but I think it, I think it is important that we really ground this. Um, and I just want to echo, I just want to echo your comments, uh, Chandrai, about Breonna Taylor and um, that tragedy and injustice today. Um, and I want, I want to hold space for that um, and, and have you know, at the front of our minds, the incredible race, the, the way that debt has been used through history as a form of racial domination. I mean, and, and we see that in so many ways. It's very much a form of economic violence um, and a form that we say demands economic disobedience in response. So this is a book, Can't Pay, Won't Pay, The Case for Economic Disobedience and Debt Abolition, that is very much an attempt to write a manifesto, right? Because this is um, this is something that we need to do together collectively, right? That the debt collective wrote this book and the debt collective is a union for debtors. We believe that debtors need to aggregate their power and come and fight for fairer terms, right? This is not something that we can, you know, solve individually, um, by just being a better debtor and paying, paying, paying our bills on time, right? It's something that we need to approach as a political problem. We need to, to band together. But, you know, that's not the story we're told. So, you know, taking it to a really, you know, you know, for me personally, 10 years ago, well, more than that now, because I'm getting old, but, you know, 14 years ago, I just felt like, fuck, I can't pay my student loans. You know, I'm never going to be out of debt. This is going to stop me from doing what I want with my life. And, you know, I signed my first one at 17. Um, there's lots of things you can't do when you're 17, but you can sign a loan that's got a 30 year life and an 8% interest rate. Um, you know, and I signed that loan and I gave quite a bit of that money to my parents who needed it at the time, which is a, you know, was not unique as we try to show in the debt collective. Most people take on financial obligations because they want to help their families because we, we, you know, it's, it's not just an individual contract. In 2008, uh, or early 2009, actually, when the economy was collapsing because of the mortgage crisis, I defaulted on my student loans. I couldn't pay. And they uh, called me and, and informed me of this and said, well, now your principal has gone up 19%. In other words, my balance ballooned and now was something like $45,000. And, you know, and I was going to be punished um, in these various ways. And just the logic of that, right? Like, I can't pay, so now I owe more. <laughs> struck me as very unfair. And now, you know, 10 years later, I'm still fighting. But that timing was fortuitous in the sense that, you know, uh, Occupy Wall Street came about in 2011. And that movement you know, ended up connecting me to Hannah and others who, you know, basically, you know, never felt, you know, these dreams, right, these American dreams of whatever, home ownership or just you know, a, a, a sort of decent life for out of reach, right? The American dream had suddenly become just getting out of debt. And that movement uh, opened space for me to sort of have these political revelations. Um, I started to see my debt uh, not just as um, this burden, but actually through conversations with others, I realized my debt was actually an asset, right? When you're a debtor, you don't see your debt that way. You just think, oh, I've got to pay this every month. It's weighing me down. But the point is, you know, all of our debts are bought and sold. They're traded. Somebody's making money off of them. That's the process that brought down the economy in 2008, right? All of these mortgages were were being bundled together, bought and sold, bet against. <laughs> and then that, you know, tanked the economy. And the bankers got bailed out and we got sold out. So there was this 
you know, kind of process of coming to where I could, where I started to understand debt in a different way and started to understand uh, the way it connected to these bigger economic, um, these bigger economic structures. And it, you know, I, I will just say one more thing, which is that even in the days of Occupy, I had read a lot about neoliberalism and the financialization of the economy, right? But these things seemed very abstract. So, you know, I had read about how since the 70s, wages had stagnated, um, you know, the state was, you know, used more and more to shore up private power, welfare was being, you know, forms of welfare were being cut, unions were being smashed. But I never made that connection that, you know, on the ground, financialization is lived as indebtedness, right? Because when they cut our, cut your wages and they cut social services, so there's no health care from, from, you know, there's no public health care, there's no public education, you end up debt financing those things. So now we have an explosion of medical debt. We have an explosion of student loans, $1.7 trillion of student loans and counting. We have people taking out payday loans and using credit cards to put food on the table, right? You know, this is, our indebtedness is how these larger economic trends manifest. And, you know, this new way of organizing the economy, this financialized way of organizing the economy, we say has opened up new ways that we can organize ourselves as debtors. Yeah, no, and that's, that's, that's great points. I just, Hannah, one the question I wanted to ask you real quick is, one thing you all said in, the, in this book, and again, folks, I just encourage everybody to get this book. It, it breaks it down. And it really also speaks even to the coronavirus pandemic conditions. So you want to get it. But one of the things that blew me away was you all said, you know, actually, people are already in forms of debt strike, right? Like, this is not about an option of choosing, you know, the question is really whether or not they're going to endure that condition collectively as a force or individually. Could you say more about that, uh, Hannah? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much. I mean, I think you see it right in the title, right? Which The title is I can't pay, which is to say I am already not paying, but rather than suffer those consequences as an individual, and what are those consequences? It's wage garnishment, it's tax garnishment, it's a trashed credit score, it's inability to access public um, services, right? Rather than suffering those alone, I can't pay, well then I won't pay, right? Which is to, it's the kind of politicization moment that Astra is talking about. So we are already suffering the consequences of indebtedness alone, we could unionize those, we could collectivize those, and actually politicize the fact that this kind of indebtedness for basic needs, whether it's our housing, whether it's our education, whether it's our medical care, whether it's going into debt for your own fucking incarceration, are you kidding me, right? Mm. These could actually be a source of collective power. So, and I can give an example of that, right? So our pilot debtors union was with uh, people who held debts from for-profit colleges they were already not paying this exorbitant debt that they owed. They were already suffering as individuals, getting their wages garnished, getting their tax returns garnished, um, unable to get into rental housing, right? Because you know when we fill out our rental applications, they ask you what's your credit score, and if you have a low credit score, it's much harder to get into that place. They were already suffering these consequences alone, individualized, and in silence, right? So it's like, let's collectivize that. Let's politicize that fact that you were robbed blind, right, by a subprime education, and you have a right to abolish that debt. And indeed, that's what the first debtors union did. It was a, debtors, a union of people who held debts from for-profit colleges. It took about four years, but as you said, Ginger, at the beginning, that union has abolished over one billion dollars of student debt repayment. So that's both future student debt payments that they would have had to pay and money back, checks back from the federal government, refunding them what they already paid, and also got um, the College for All legislation on the table. So it's both an idea and, at this point, a precedent. That's, re that's really helpful. And, you know, right now we, we're talking about this on the individual level, but I think a big thing that this book and this movement does is that it, it helps us to understand how our individual debt is also connected to larger and, you know, debt of, you know, related to our institutions our, and some of our public institutions and elements of what could be a commons. Could you all talk a little bit? Could we just introduce some of that idea also about debt organizing as well, that level of it? Yeah. So um, but at first, I want to kind of go back to your, your, your really insightful points about morality, the morality of debt and this feeling that we have that we should pay our debts. And like so many good impulses, it 
you know, kind of gets co-opted, right? Because, um, so one thing the Debt Collective is trying to do is to challenge the phony morality around debt and to say, you know, this idea that all debts have to be repaid. Well, no, they don't. You know, rich people walk away from their debts all the time. Donald Trump in 2016, you know, was on CBS or some big network and said, I'm the king of debt. Not paying your debts is smart. You know, he's got something like seven bankruptcies under his belt. Again, look at what happened in the mortgage crisis. Look at what is happening today with the COVID pandemic and the economic response. What happened is these companies gorged themselves on corporate debt and the federal government's basically buying it up, lending to them at lower rates. They're renegotiating. They're getting all sorts of assistance. There's a huge double standard in the way that wealthy debtors are able to sort of leverage their debt and then working class people are, are treated, right? If you you know, you can't walk away from your debts. You're penalized in all of these ways Hannah Hannah just mentioned and, and many others. So I think, you know, one thing we always ask is, you know, well, what are our true debts, our true obligations to one another? And, you know, we're not able to pay those because we're being extracted from, because we're being forced into these predatory contracts. And this manifests in you know all sorts of ways. So you know from the example of these these loans for these predatory colleges that are the number one producers of black and brown graduates, right? I mean this is because there is not a commitment to public free education as a human right that should not be attached to you know your future career or earnings, but just as a public good. You know uh, it's opened up space for these you know private supposed colleges to to. Um, uh, basically leave people worse off. You know, you come out, you can't get a job and you've got $70,000 in loans. Um, so, so, you know, as Hannah said, why should you have to pay that? <laughs> this is not a moral debt. It's not that you're immoral if you don't make those payments. The debt itself is immoral. Um, and a similar, you know, a similar dynamic um, is... Or, or, or rather, these, these structural conditions can't be separated from the kind of institutional debt you mentioned. So the right wing, one way to say it is that the right wing, you know, goes on and on about the deficit, right? They say, okay, well, we, there's not enough money. There has to be austerity because you people are too entitled. You want all this public spending. You want all these public goods. It's totally false. You know, we're indebted because we, we are denied the public services we need. To, to live a decent life, right? So one of our lines in the book is, you know, people aren't living beyond their means. They're denied the means to live. Um, and what happens is that, you know, similarly to individuals, our municipalities, which is another way of saying our communities are forced into debt contracts. They're forced to debt finance the things communities need to thrive. So instead of taxing wealthy residents, we borrow from them. That's, that's what bonds are. Bonds are just borrowing from rich residents who should be taxed and then allowing them to collect interest, right? That's their, their, their uh, sort of privilege for being borrowed from. Meanwhile, Wall Street acts as a mediator and gets to collect fees. So our communities borrow for things like bridges, and uh, schools, but they also borrow. Uh, the Action Center for Race and the Economy, Acre, has shown that they have they borrow for police brutality. There are police brutality bonds. They borrow money so that they can have the um, a financial reserve to pay out um, <laughs> pay out when the cops kill people, when they murder people. Um, and what that means is that investors are making money off of these police brutality bonds, right? So these, this is a system that operates at every level. It also operates internationally at the sovereign level, where we have, um, we have nations that are, are deeply indebted um, and therefore can't provide the, the services that, um, that their populations need. So, you know, there's, you don't want to make the analogies too literal, and yet they're there. Um, and we see basically this, this system that is, you know, con it's, it's set up so that investors and um, bankers, financiers benefit. Um, and it's this very you know, brutal form of extraction um, for, for not just debtors, because you don't literally have to have debt. If you're in a community that's being extracted from in this way, it affects you, right? So it's, it's a way of, of extracting from regular people. Yeah, um, 
I, so yeah, that's. I mean, and just to le- just to dig on this a little bit more because I do think that you know I know that there's some people probably watching who are really advanced in their understanding of this, and then there's some of us who are still learning it. So I want to bring us all on the same page. I mean, one of the things is you know if you have this individual model that people think of debt, like I loan money to my friend or someone, you know, it's like when you don't pay the debt back, there's an injury to a person, right? Could you, I was wondering if either of you, maybe, maybe Hannah, talk about how the difference between thinking of like what happens when I don't pay my debt to in that kind of thinking versus what's actually going on in terms of these larger, these larger healthcare debts, college debts and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. So I think healthcare debt is actually a really useful place to start. So I go to the hospital, we have insufficient healthcare coverage in this country, or it's attached to my employment, or it's too expensive, it's privatized, right? Again, it doesn't exist as that kind of public good. And so I have a crazy hospital bill from having shown up at the emergency room, right? But maybe ideally, I got some good care, and I was helped. And therefore, I feel this moral obligation to repay. And I imagine that debt, exactly as both of you have said, have said, as a debt between me and maybe even I kind of personalize it and the doctor, right? But or at least a debt between me and that hospital, right? But then let's say they send me that bill a month later and I'm like, holy shit, $10,000 for being in the emergency room for two hours? I don't have that, right? Who has that? No, because this test was $5,000, this test was $6,000. And so then I can't pay, right? So is the hospital accountant sitting there and looking through the roles of hospital debtors and saying, oh, you know, we have to follow up with Hannah. We have to follow up with Chenjerai. We gave them such good service. You know, absolutely not. They sell that shit off and take a tax break. And you know who they sell it to? They sell it to debt collectors. And they sell it to debt collectors on these secondary and tertiary markets for pennies on the dollar, right? So if I'm a debt collector, I buy your $1,000 hospital bill for $2.00. And then the the hospital writes all of the rest of that off as a tax break. So the hospital still gets paid in full, right? Now the debt collector who just bought that debt for $2 comes back to me and says, you owe me $10,000 plus $300 in late fees plus another extra, right? So they're going to make like a gazillion percent profit, but it just starts to show you, right? First you have the hospital and the, the patient. But then the hospital sells it off, they get a tax break. So you have the hospital's financial relationship with the government in that case. And then you have the hospital's relationship with the debt collector. The debt collector only pays $2 and stands to profit almost $8,000, right? Or whatever that is, $10,000 minus $2, $9,998, whatever it is. Plus, so one of the projects that we were involved in shortly before we started um, the Debt Collective, which is specifically these debtors' unions, was the Rolling Jubilee, right, where a group of us, got licensed as debt collectors to buy on these secondary and tertiary markets, pennies on the dollar, and then crowdsource the money that we needed to abolish those debts, and then just writing to the debtor and saying, hey, your debt is gone. So that rolling jubilee project starts to show this is not a moral relationship between a benevolent giver. That doctor that doctor probably makes $150,000 a year and she is fine. That doctor is fine, right? The hospital is fine. The hospital got a big tax write-off. What we actually need to understand, we, we need to understand those kind of multiple relationships. But then the shift from kind of rolling jubilee, which is like a hack and was cool but can't possibly get rid of everybody's debt, the shift from the rolling jubilee to the union is this like... Um, counterintuitive idea, what if all of our medical debts together gave us power, right? Individually, I'm afraid to open that envelope. I know it says I owe more than I owed last ma- last month, and I couldn't pay last month, and I can't pay now. Individually, I see a number on my phone. I don't know who it is. I'm like, it's a debt collector. I'm not going to pick it up. But what if all of us who owed debts, who owed medical, care, medical debts, and it's like some astronomical number, even in the wake of Obamacare, right? It's still an astronomical number got together and said, we are not going to pay. We are going to form a debtor's union and use our collective debt as leverage over this system until we can have reparative public medical care in this country. We refuse until we don't have to go into debts for our basic needs. That's the kind of flip that the union model offers. Wow. Yeah, I think that's really, I think, so I feel like we've done away with debt morality. Can we can we say we dispense with that? You know, we, we did that in like you know ten minutes. Excellent. This is why this is why I hang with the smart people. You know what I'm saying? So, all right. So now we've cast that off. Um, one of the other amazing things about this book is that you all managed to really address and calibrate this 
to the urgency of our current moment, right? And the way that this is intensifying in the context of um, the pandemic. And, you know, I just want to say living here in Philadelphia, I saw that, right? Like, you know, here there was all this talk of austerity. You know, everyone's going to have to, there's going to be shared sacrifice, right? Like, you know, shared sacrifice being a code word meaning, you know, uh, sort of billionaires and large institutions in Philadelphia who aren't paying taxes, you know, are somehow going to sacrifice the same as citizens who are going to really have to make, you know, life-threatening choices. Um, but it, I would also want to say in that same context, it's interesting, of this supposedly starved, impoverished budget, there still was a proposal to give the police a $19 million increase, um, which is interesting. But I just was wondering if you could, you all could talk about how the, these dynamics of debt have intensified during the corona virus and if we could you know just move into that space a little bit yeah hannah why don't you start this one sure i remember toward the beginning um of the coronavirus pandemic uh astra was going to go do a webinar with kianga yamada taylor and naomi klein and they did a series of them and we came to call them the taylor taylor klein episodes at the at the deck collective and so we were kind of talking about and it was really it was right at the beginning of the pandemic right we definitely didn't see things as clearly as we saw them now but one thing that was so clear from the very beginning of the pandemic, it's not like suddenly everybody wasn't able to pay, right? It just made clear what had been there all along, which was that people were either barely squeaking by or already not paying. So I remember being on a call with Astra and a couple other people and being like, racial capitalism is the pandemic and the coronavirus just reveals it, right? The coronavirus, that's not to say it, has, it hasn't changed certain kind of empirical situations. Of course it has. But when we talk about the uneven health outcomes for African-American and Latinx communities, right? Or when we talk about who is it that is at disproportionate risk of eviction right now because they haven't paid their rent since March, right? We are talking about intergenerational continuities in racial capitalism that predate coronavirus by centuries, frankly, right? And coronavirus just sort of lays it bare for us. So one of the things that's funny is the word I was going to use. It's not funny. But as I've been doing kind of debt collective talks and webinars during the coronavirus pandemic, during the pandemic, I'm still using the same statistics. This is how indebted people who live in the United States are. This is how indebted we are for medical care. This is how indebted we are for our own incarceration. This is how indebted we are for our housing. This is how indebted we are for our education. I don't even need to change those statistics. They are so horrifying before the pandemic starts, right? So again, the pandemic just kind of reveals the radically racially uneven um, fragility of our households and communities, and then redoubles this who gets bailed out and who gets sold out, right? I mean, it's like, so some of us are lucky enough to get $1,200 stimulus checks that Mnuchin tells us are supposed to last us for three months, while, corp while the largest corporations, not the smaller business, but the larger corporations literally get billions of dollars billions of dollars. So we can go into the debt collective project, the sort of um, eviction and rental union stuff in a moment, but that's where I would start. Racial capitalism is the pandemic. That's it. I think too, it's, you know, it has been a, it's been a, an event that has kind of made what we've say, what we've been saying, you know, make more sense to people, right? Um, because the call for a jubilee, which you know, the jubilee is the old term for the, the the wiping of the slate, the erasing of all debts that goes back, you know, thousands and thousands of years. You know, you can hear this being uh, this call being picked up by a much bigger coalition now. Um, and I think it's important, you know, to to acknowledge that um, because societies have been in crisis points like this before, and you know. What is happening right now? I mean, when people don't have income, their debts pile up. They spiral into delinquency, default, despair. I know that we're seeing an uptick in debt-related deaths, you know, that people who are feeling like they, you know, they just can't go on, they can't get out of this hole. Before the pandemic, there was a report that said the average American dies $62,000 in debt. Um, and debt has this incredible psychic cost. I mean, it's incredibly stressful. It's stressful in the mind. It's stressful in the body. Um, you know, and that's part of its power. I think that's why the powerful wield it, right? Because it's a form of social control. <laughs> you know, when you're indebted, you're, you're, you know, 
you're more risk averse. And in fact, there's research that shows that too, that um, that actually when people get their debts canceled, they take more risk, they move around, you know, they live more freely. So, um, you know, I think, I think it's important to see how far and wide, you know, this call for debt cancellation has been picked up. We see, um, we see activists arguing to, you know, that, and saying that, you know, we need rent canceled, we need medical debt canceled, we need student debt canceled, we're seeing the movement for Black Lives say so, we're seeing uh, representatives in Washington say so, right? The squad is you know, constantly tweeting about how we need to cancel rent, there have been various legislative proposals, and that's partly because you know, canceling debt makes good economic sense because what it allows, it, you know, it allows people to spend their money on other things, on survival. Um, and uh, to sort of get the economy going. And that is not our goal in the debt collective. We want to completely transform the economy and rewrite you know, the, the social and economic contracts. But I think this is a moment to really push on this form of politics. And it's a moment where it shows that you know, we can't afford to not organize as debtors. Because otherwise, you know, what's going to happen? What happened after 2008? The fact is the banks emerged fucking stronger than ever. I mean, that is a fact. They came out of that. They were not chastened. They were not, you know, no bankers went to jail, right? But the sector is stronger than it was before. And they, again, you know, cor- the corporate sector just took on more and more debt. So, you know, what we're going to see as people fall deeper into debt is a kind of equivalent power grab, a grab of wealth and power, um, you know, at the top. And, you um, and debt abolition, you know, in that context sort of makes more sense than ever. Unfortunately, our politics are not rational. Um, we have to build the power if that's, you know, what the outcome we want. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to model this form of power building that we think is, you know, really, really important. And if there's one thing we can do, and I said this at that first webinar with, with Naomi and Kianga was, you know, one thing we'd like to do for people, if you can't pay your bills right now, right, if you spent that $1,200 stimulus check on debts, which is what research shows most people did. If you spent your, you know, your wonderfully generous $600 a week unemployment, you know, insurance, just to pay your rent, to pay your bills, to just stay afloat, which is what most people have done. That's just a roundabout bailout for the creditors and for the landlords who you owe money to, right? Mm. You should be Mm. getting $600 a week and they should be taking a haircut, right? This is really just a Rube Goldberg way of business as usual, keeping those creditors afloat. Um, but if that's your situation, if you know you can't open that envelope, as Hannah said, because it stresses you out, we just want you to know you shouldn't be ashamed, right? If we we will try to erase your debts, we believe we can organize and do that. But if, if we we also want to erase that shame, erase that sense of stigma, um, and um, and relieve relieve that emotional burden that debt has has because right now you know it's clearer than ever your debt is not your fault. Can I just add Absolutely. one more thing? I'm so sorry. Just because, like this moment, the pandemic moment that has coincided with an uprising moment, right? An anti-white supremacy uprising moment, fighting anti-black violence moment. It has showed I. I feel like people can feel, I hope we, many of us here today, we can feel our power in a different way. And one of the things that it's revealed is that so much of what we at the Debt Collective and others in the social justice movement have been asking for for so long, and people say, oh, it's not possible, it's not possible, it's not possible. My family hasn't been paying our student debt payments for the last five months, what about y'all, right? There's a student debt moratorium, there's a rent moratorium, there's a mortgage moratorium. Suddenly all of these things where they said, oh, that's not possible, boom, poof, they come, right? So we also find ourselves backed in, shout out to the LA Tenants Union and many other tenants unions around the country, we have backed our way into a rent strike. We are on a nationwide rent strike right now. There are 30 million people across the country who have either paid none or paid some small portion of their rent since March, right? So yet again, like the can't pay, won't pay, it's like, well, I can't pay, so I'm not paying. But what if I could use, what if we as renters together could leverage this moment to renegotiate private property in this country, right? To move some of this this real estate off the speculative market and into community land trusts. What if we could use our collective power if we have a big corporate landlord? What if all of us who live in all of the buildings that that landlord owns across the country, if I'm invitation homes, right? Or across the city, if I'm some major landlord in a given municipality, what if all of us say, 
we'll negotiate with you collectively, right? This is how much we'll give you to buy this property or to take it off the speculative market and turn it into a community land trust, right? So how can we feel our power in this moment? And I will just, I just want to end by saying, because Astor was talking about M for BL, or Movement for Black Lives. And indeed, in the June week of action that many of us here probably participate in, Wednesday's demands were rent cancellation, mortgage cancellation, a moratorium on utility and water shutoffs, a cancellation of student debt, medical debt, and other forms of debt, right? So I just like the way that these demands are now sort of widely shared in the social justice movement is to say we can and do have the power to change the system that we live in. And this moment is showing us that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and folks, I just want to say there are some incredible questions coming in. And I just want to sort of let you know that we're going to we're going to address questions and we're going to and and I particularly like we're going to get into some specifics, how you can join if you're interested in joining a debtors union, how different people can help in a concrete way. But we also want to hold space to kind of zoom out a little bit um, on some of these issues. But I, we also have some videos because I think that, you know, one of the things it's hard to necessarily get a sense of it's hard to get a feel for how powerful it is for when people come together. Right. Because we deal with our debt in private and we and we understand it as like our personal failure, you know, and we carry it. And when people come together and realize that these debts never were moral. Right. And then and, and we move. It's just really powerful. So I don't know if we have that video, but if we could play it, that would be great. So I have soon known debt. And then I also was the primary caregiver for both of my parents who died of cancer. And watching or being with them as we navigated the insurance system so that they could pay. Okay, this is both like remembering what it was like and then also anger that we live in a society that's not based on care and well being and liberation for each person. So I burned this in solidarity with all people who are dealing with medical issues and insurance. Also, those of us who are still dealing with um, student loan and those of us who are working for liberation and freedom. Yeah, so, you know, that just gives you a little taste of the feel of what this is like, you know, what, what it's like to be in this movement and what it's like to come together. Um, one thing I just want to say on that note is, you know, one thing that really blew me away about this book is so often in our movements, um, we are, you know, the forces that are arrayed against us will try to divide us by telling us that our movements around labor are somehow separate from our movements around race, anti-racism and empire. Um, and one thing that was really interesting and that I had, that I sort of had thought of, but really was spoken to explicitly in this book was one, as, as Hannah was just saying, thinking of our debt as leverage, right? I mean, so often, you know, one of the problems of political, liberal political rationality, right, is that everything is a dialogue, right? It's a dialogue. If we could just persuade people, if we could just give people the facts about debt, and it's like, there are some facts about debt to learn here. I mean, we, you know, you're welcome. I welcome everyone to become a uh, Democrat, to become informed. But this is about leverage and power, right? And it's really, that comes clear, in the ways our debt gives us leverage. And one of the really interesting things was how our leverage can actually um, be, be used to talk about repair and reparations, right? Um, and put reparations, make you know, sort of cause that to intersect and become at the center of the debt agenda. So um, I think that's really powerful. Um, one question I wanted to just bring in related to that was, you know, someone has asked, I just wanted to bring this one question because it's so important. You know, when we're thinking about, you know, borrowing from banks who are lending um, on stolen and looted indigenous lands, right? I mean, how how is debt, can we just go back a little further? How is debt related and materially linked to, you know, ongoing settler colonialism? Astra, you want to tell your founding father story? Yeah, I'll just say a little bit and then Hannah, Hannah can build. I mean, you know, I think when you look at the way debt has been used as a form of 
domination through history, it's, it's really astounding. I mean, that, that precedes capitalism, right? It precedes industrialization. It's like a really brutal form of controlling people. Um, and, you know, we, we see this, uh, you know, really vividly. I think one really vivid example is the Haitian Revolution, which is the first multiracial, you know, small d democratic, like successful slave revolt. And what happened to Haiti? Haiti was punished with an unpayable debt to France, right? That it was still <laughs> had to pay. Um, uh, you know, and this debt was not was not forgiven. So I think you see it there. Um, the founding fathers were very concerned about debt and debtors revolts. Madison referred to the wicked project of debt abolition, right? I mean, they understood that as they understood it, they were part of the natural aristocracy, you know, the landed class, the landed gentry, the slave owning class. And then, you know, there were these, you know, there were um, these, you know, peons who had debt, who didn't deserve to have political rights. Um, and they were very worried about, about debtors revolts. Uh, one founding father who had a slightly different view was Thomas Jefferson, who wrote some seemingly enlightened things saying, you know, debt shouldn't weigh down future generations, debt should expire within the span of a generation, right? Um, you know, that you shouldn't have to pay them interminably. Uh, except a letter from 1803, he made an exception. He said, you know what? We should use debt against indigenous people. We should be grateful, we should be gleeful to see the best among them driven into debt by our lending houses so that will force them to uh, to give us their land. That will be a tool by which we can dispossess them. So, you know, this keen awareness of debt's power as a as a as a as a weapon of dispossession, while also, you know, it was setting the stage for the double standard I called out earlier, which is like, well, and for us, you know, debt should be written off, they shouldn't go on too long, they shouldn't be too extractive or punitive. Um, you know, and I think so, so, you know, that's, that's the beginning, right? Um, and, uh, and we're living the consequences of that today. And I really, you know, I do want to hear from Hannah, because I think one aspect of this book that Hannah was really insistent on, and I think rightfully, was this idea that we can't, in, we can't um, just talk about public goods and not question what public means, right? We can't just talk about universality without saying, well, hold on, what about all of the inequalities and all the injustice? that the present day is built upon. Um, and so I want to hand it over to Hannah just because, you know, I think that was a really valuable and important contribution to the book and this vision of what what this this way of articulating what it is we're working towards. Thanks, Esther. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about that. But first, I just want to lift up what you said and kind of put it in broader terms, which is that we're largely talking about the United States in the book, though not exclusively. We talk transnationally as well. But I will speak about the United States for just a moment here, which is to say that the United States entered the stage of global capitalism, right, through land, the theft of land and the theft of labor. And these relationships were mediated by debt instruments through and through. I'm thinking of my friend Kay Sue Park's work, right? Like the mortgage was one of the primary legal ways, licit ways, right, that you find white settlers stealing land from indigenous people was via the mortgage. Sound familiar? 2008, right? I mean, these debt instruments become, Chandra, we were talking about this before the call even started, these kind of like licit forms of racist violence and sort of intergenerational wealth transfer for white people and intergenerational wealth theft from indigenous people, from black people, right? From BIPOC people, BIPOC communities more generally, and certainly from poor white people as well, though not as disproportionately so. So I think it's really important to think too often when we start talking about neoliberalism and financialization, we start that talk in the 1970s and we don't think about those intergenerational wealth transfers that Astra is talking about in the case of the wake of the Haitian revolution or the case of the wake of Kenya's independence, right? When Kenya has to pay a huge debt mediated by the World Bank back to their colonizers, right? For the land that they have they stole before and have now had to, had to um, give back to the people, right? So those kinds of intergenerational and transnational wealth and theft relationships are with us every day. They're with us in our rent contracts. They're with us in our mortgage contracts. They're with, with us in payday loan spots on the corner. They're with us in the fact that we have to pay for our own incarceration. So I just want to like 
have that as the floor and then just say the final thing, which is that, you know, one of the things that we say that debtors unions can do, what we can leverage our power for, right? It doesn't make any sense to make public college free again. It was free before, but to make it free again, um, sorry, it doesn't make any sense to abolish student debt unless we make public college free again, or else we're all going to go back into debt, right? It doesn't make any sense to abolish medical debt unless people actually have access to medical care on the back end, right? And incarceration debt, human cajun, we just need to talk about abolition. We don't even need to talk about that one. But too often when people say, you know, free public education, free medical care, more social housing, they call it public goods and they call it universal public goods. And so what we have said at the Debt Collective, what I have tried to insist on, which Astor really generously, you know, hat tipped me for, is a phrase called reparative public goods, right? Because too often in the history of this country, these sort of massive programs for universal public goods, the New Deal comes to mind retrenches forms of racialized differentiation, gender differentiation, who gets access to it, right? Sexualized differentiation. So it's like white male headed households married to a woman <laughs> get access to, you know, your special mortgage clause or your special GI bill or your this or that. You're a domestic worker. You know, you're an African-American um, agricultural worker. You're not going to get it. So now when we at the Debt Collective, and I hope more broadly, I do it in my own academic work as well, we try to talk about reparative public goods, which is to say the public goods that will change the fabric of this country and beyond these borders, because these relationships are cross borders, will be reparative public goods. They will center repair and redress. They will center it. That will be first. And those are the kinds of public goods that will eventually change the fabric and put us into a, a place of public luxury. Um, for all of us. So that's the that's the phrase, reparative public goods. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I just say one more thing in response to one thing I think what's kept me going with the debt collective with this project like for years now um, is that we ask these big questions, these big philosophical questions. And you know, and I want to shout out David Graeber, the author of Debt the First Five Thousand Years, who was our collaborator in the early days right um right around the time of occupy wall street and who you know asked this question you know there's sort of two of them one do all debts have to be repaid we've already said you know the answer is no but the bigger philosophical question is you know who owes what to whom you know what do we owe each other what obligations do we want to have together that we can't to one another that we can't put a number on you know i mean reparations is one right we want to pay that debt, even though it's a debt that you can't numerically represent. It's a debt that demands a whole restructuring of society and our international um, economic arrangements, right? I mean, so we ask these big questions. At the same time, we're really strategic. We are building a union inspired by a labor union model, right? The thing is that unlike workers, debtors don't share a factory floor. We don't share a workplace. We share creditors. We share economic conditions. We have to find it, each other at a distance. Um, so there are challenges, but we know, you know, from looking at the labor movement that it's only by creating these kinds of economic relationships and these economic alliances and creating solidarity um, that we create this, the big, you know, um, transformative structural changes that like this moment makes so clear we need. And so it's that mix, I guess, for me, part of why I stick with this and write the book and do the organizing is it's like these big, meaningful, philosophical questions, like who we want to be, you know, yeah, what do we owe each other? What kind of world do we want to see? And then the nitty gritty, like, how do we get there? Where's a, where do we have some power? Where's leverage? How can we, you know, uh, how can we make a difference? And, you know, we've put money uh, and kept money uh, in people's pockets, not just student loans, but by disputing all other manner of debts, you know, and we've changed the conditions so that, you know, people who are legislators can start, you know, making big pronouncements. I mean, Bernie Sanders said he was going to erase all medical debt, essentially by scaling up the rolling jubilee. <laughs> you know, that was his proposal. People are saying, you know, cancel all student debt in the College for All Act. So I think, um, you know, I think that duality for me is really important as an organizer is speaking something uh, profound, but also practical and keeping power at the fore. Wow, that was that was that said it so well. I just want to let that wash over us. You know what I'm saying? <laughs>
So, um, but as we're doing that, I was wondering, we have a really uh, nice um, video about the College for All movement. That's such a bummer. Yeah. Pam Hunt, who is one of our nation's first student debt strikers, on fire in Washington, D.C. She is such fire in that speech, so that's too bad. But, um, so Pam is one of the original, Pamela Hunt is one of the original Corinthian 15, so one of the first student debt strikers in this country. So organized with you know what started out as 15 people and eventually became tens of thousands of people who started to for, or form that debtors union that we talked about before, people who held debts from for-profit colleges organized for years, it was probably about four or five years, demanding from the very beginning student debt abolition and free public college for all, so starting to make that demand around 2014, 2015. And that is a video from exactly, or almost exactly a year ago, last June, not this past June, but the one before that, of Ilhan Omar, Pramila Jayapal, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and Bernie Sanders, I don't know which angle it was from, but they're all there. And Pam at the microphone because Ilhan Omar and Pramila Jayapal were the original authors of the bill called College for All. And they reached out to the Debt Collective and they said, this is your grassroots organizing work. This is your bill. Your demands wrote this bill from five years ago and we're all just catching up now. So inviting there are a couple Debt Collective members who end up speaking there. But it's just Pam just saying, um, just on fire about how she's not, and this is important to the morality question and then I'll shut up. She says, I'm not asking for forgiveness. I'm here demanding justice abolish this debt. Wow. That's that's what I'm talking about, y'all. See that and see this is the thing. You know, don't people look listen, when you get involved with this, don't let people tell you it's not practical. You know, they will always do that to us. And I love, you know, the, the debt organizing is one of the things that shows like people try to label stuff that we're doing is not we're naive. We don't get it. We're pe somehow we're pessimistic even though we believe that there can be a different world, right? Uh it's like all those things. And then guess what? A couple of years later, with us pushing, they wind up taking up our demands because they realize that they're on the right side of history and that they're the way to win people to, to the cause. So, so, you know, I just want to say quickly, there's so much in this book. And, you know, this is about a movement, not a book. A book is a portal into a movement. 
uh, you know, but I would say, you know, definitely check it out. I mean, one thing that we didn't get, that we didn't talk about right now is we got into like algorithms and technology and some of the ways that these, these factors are shaped and intensified under this new sort of digital condition that we're in. Um, and that old things are translated in the new, in the, in the new condition. Right. But I did want to end on the note of abolition and, you know, talking to Hannah and Astra, they made an interesting point, an interesting connection to some of our other abolition movements. Right. A point that was lifted up. Um, uh, I first heard it lifted up by Ruthie Wilson Gilmore, which has to do with the fact that when we think of abolition, we often think of what's going to be taken away, what's going to be ended, right? And that actually the movement really is, a, our movement's about presence, right? Um, you know, what, and so, yeah, without me even elaborating uh, sort of clumsily about that, would one of you want to speak to debt abolition as a horizon? Yeah, Astrid, you want me to start and then you can finish us off? Mm -hmm. Um so yeah, I mean, it's in the title of the book, right? So can't pay, won't pay, the case for economic disobedience and debt abolition. And it was actually one of my mentors and a kind of a very generous mentor to the Debt Collective, Dylan Rodriguez, one of the organizers with Critical Resistance, good friend of Dr. Ruthie Wilson Gilmore. You know, we were, at an, we were at an organizing event here in LA and Dylan was like, you know, what if we take the abolition in debt abolition seriously? And he really pushed us on this. And so we've thought a lot about it in the interceding year. And exactly, it has been also my learning from Professor Gilmore, who I first met at Occupy Wall Street, actually, Ruthie. Um, you know, she always says, and critical resistance always says, abolition is a world without prisons, policing, borders, capitalism, patriarchy, ableism, right? Depends how far you go and what, how, you, that, how expansive that vision is. But it's also a world with, right? So if you look at the headquarters, the window of the critical resistance headquarters in Oakland, California. One window is abolition is a world without prisons, policing borders. And the window right next to it is a beautiful mural of an abolition is a world with, and what do they list there? Healthcare, housing, education, rewarding work, right? A, a, a abolition is also green, a beautiful thriving environment. So the question is, how do we get to a world without prisons? How do we get to a world without policing? Part of what we have to have is the presence right, of these communities of care, communities of education, communities of shelter, communities of wellness and health care. Right now, we go into debt for all those things. We go into crippling debt for all those things. So the idea is that debtors unions can be that um, power building mechanism, that leverage building mechanism to get us to a world where we have those reparative public institutions. We are provided with those reparative public goods so that racist prisons and policing no longer solve the problem of white supremacy and racism and inequality in this country, right? We have to have those institutions to ameliorate these other problems. So that's how Dylan and Ruthie, we have learned from you, or at least I have, but it's been a big conversation about taking debt, the abolition into abolition seriously. I think you said it, Hannah. I mean, really, I mean, to me, you know, it's also part of, you know, I take some pleasure in the idea of being Madison's worst nightmare, right? And the wicked project of debt abolition as we live in this constitutional hell, thanks to those guys. Um, and there is, you know, we've, it's been a refrain of this conversation, but there is, you know, there is this incredibly, um, destructive and violent racial component to indebtedness. I mean, we, one of our early slogans when Occupy was happening was debt is the tie that binds the 99%, but it doesn't bind everyone equally, right? I mean, we know that the white middle class was built on access to credit mortgages on fair terms, subsidized by the government, you know, something like 97% of the sort of FHA mortgages, you know, went went to white families in the in the late 30s and 40s, you know, and then there's redlining, right? And there's either um, predatory inclusion, which Kiangi Yamada Taylor talks about. So, you know, you can only get credit on these incredibly exploitative terms or you're just locked out. And we know, I mean, the statistics are just overwhelming. It's like, who takes out payday loans? You know, probably a single mother who's black, right? Who has the highest student debt burden? Black women. Um, who was most likely to get a subprime mortgage, even if their credit score was high? Black families, probably in a city like Baltimore. And so, you know, there's, it's still one of these things, like debtor politics isn't separate. It's not separate from these other struggles. Um, 
And the average, you know, Hannah has mentioned, you know, that we go into debt, people have to go into debt for incarceration. The you know, average bail bond in California is $50,000. That's the debt people hold. Um, so we, you know, it's a conscious attempt to link because one thing we see in terms of building this union is all of the ways that it's, it complements other struggles. It's complementary to labor organizing. If you're paying these debts every month, you know, that's a form of wage theft. Basically, the 1% robs you twice. They underpay you and then force you to borrow so you can keep a roof over your head, food on the table, you know, so you can, uh, you know, go see a doctor, right? So it's complementary to labor organizing. There's all this, uh, this um, uh, way that it overlaps with racial justice movements. There's a gender dimension to debt. Um, uh, and uh, it, I think, also dovetails in really powerful ways with the climate movement because what debt does what interest is, it's a promise of future payment, but you're promising to pay more tomorrow than you have today. On this fundamental level, it locks us into a capitalist economy of endless growth that we know is unsustainable for the planet and its inhabitants, human and non-human. So this is like, it's a, it's a way of thinking about the way our economy is organized that, that I think really um, augments all of these other forms of organizing that we're already doing. You know, housing justice, it's obvious as we're about to fix, face this huge eviction crisis. Um, so, you know, what we want to do partly with this book is have this way of seeing the world. Not everyone should have to wear debt goggles all the time like Hannah and I do. <laughs> put, put them on once in a while and see if it brings new strategies, new tactics to the table. Yes, yes. I'm not taking my dead goggles off. I just I just put other glasses on over top of them. You know what I'm saying? Like I because it's just I just it helps me understand, you know. Um, thank you so much to Hannah and Astra and to Haymarket. But we want to move into we have some great questions. And I think I'm gonna start off with the questions kind of practical because we've been kind of we've been kind of you know dealing with some of the bigness of this. But we had one really interesting question. Someone asked how do we organize debt unions in rural areas where people feel very isolated? I thought that was a good question. Does someone want to take that? Pastor, are you nodding at yeah. me? I mean, I think, well, I think, I mean, to me, I just, this one reason I'm excited about debtors union is it, it has a different relationship to geography. As I just said, right. Debtors don't share a workplace the way laborers do. And so it crosses that urban and rural divide. If you look at the first pilot union that Hannah has been talking about, the members had all gone to these, they had gone to a, a for-profit college chain, this, in, this, this corporate conglomerate that, that um, had outposts across the nation, right? So the people in that first union were urban and rural, they were old and younger, they were black, they were white, they were, um, Men, they were women, you know, so it's one of, so I think that, um, so on that level, you know, rural debtors can join our current student debtors union right now, going to debtcollective.org. Um, and so I think this is the thing, you know, it's, we, there's potential in organizing debtors by geography. And so we're doing some very, uh, some stuff that's focused on Los Angeles County, on California, we're doing work in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania. But I think that actually this is a strategy that that actually you know, makes sense for people who don't live in urban areas um, because it, it acknowledges that, that our economic system works at a distance, right? I mean, it's a way of responding to the fact that that's how our economy works. No matter where we are, we have to pay our debts. Our debt sticks to us whether we're living in you know, a small town or whether we're living in a big city. Um, so you know, I think to me that's part of the sort of uh, utility of this model. I would just add, because I see the two, I see two questions, you know, how, this question of how do we organize unions in rural areas and how do I start or join a student debt union. So Astra said it, but I'm just going to say it again. Check out, go to debtcollective.org. Um, gosh, it maybe will launch today, it'll maybe launch in a week. Right now you can already join, it says join a union, sign up. We've actually made what some of our organizers call a virtual factory floor. So we have our own um, online space where debtors can meet and organize across geography because there are things that we can do in geographic areas. So for example, we're doing an anti-eviction project here in Los Angeles, right? Philadelphia has a couple things going on with really um, intense municipal debt issues there. But a lot of debts, right? Bank of America doesn't care if you live in rural place X 
or right here in the heart of Los Angeles, right? So there are campaigns, there are unions, there are tactics that unite people from all different kinds of places across this country and across the world. So I just encourage everybody to check out debtcollective.org, sign up, join in, um, and we will we will get you plugged in. Yeah, and the student uh, student debtors of all schools now. So we are building a larger student debt union that is students from for-profit colleges, students from public colleges, private colleges, nonprofit, because the fact is that if you have federal student loans, it's all the same on the back end. You all owe money through the same system. It's the same pipes and you have the same, um, you ultimately have the same goals if what you're fighting for is a student debt jubilee and reparative free truly liberating public education. And so people need to break down those barriers. This is not about organizing at your one campus. I mean, that could be a, 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 you know, a building block, right? But we need alliances between all manner of student borrowers and that's what we're building. And so there's a, a national union and also we're starting to build hubs uh, that are regional, that are in uh, communication with the national. Could, could I just jump in and say a couple of things? One is, you know, it, it really is, the nature of this work, I think, really is regional. It has to be specific to certain regions. And, you know, with some of the um, organizing I was invited into in Philly, for example, you know, we were able to, on one one way that the Debt Collective has been gotten involved is by joining a coalition of workers with the Our City, Our Schools Coalition, who's really like parents and teachers and community members who, who won the victory of ultimately getting the school board back to local control, but now have to deal with the way that debt is used against our coalition. So debt collective and, you know, trainings and some of the tools have given us a way to think about that larger structural issue, right, of, of our school debt and, uh, and our, our school budget and how debt is used against our schools. Also, simultaneously, I know you all have been developing some really sort of more individual tools that might support people. Is there anything we could say about that real briefly, just to let people know, like, if you're in a situation where you feel like really in crisis, Yes, we're trying to, you know, recruit you and have you join our movement, but there's also some support and specific help for you. Go for that, Hannah. You're in the tools right now. Okay. Yeah. I mean, so one of the actually, um, one of the strategies that I feel like the Debt Collective has used to great effect is legal mutual aid, right? Disputing a debt as a legal process, and this actually speaks to a question in the chat from a consumer attorney or a consumer attorney in training, um, disputing a debt, whether that is a rent debt or a student debt or disputing your credit card score or disputing, you know, um, whatever, a, a medical debt is fucking impossible. It's like, it is a completely opaque, complex, process that nobody knew how to do. All of us know our credit scores are fucked up. All of us know it's a racist as hell algorithm, right? That's telling me that I need to pay less for something than my black friend because she's black, right? But we have no, it's all okay. It's all um, completely off limits to us. We can't see it. So one of the things that the Debt Collective has tried to do from the beginning is provide these tools of legal mutual aid. So we have, if you go to the website debtcollective.org and you'll see, you know, use the tools or tools or something like that, you'll see we have a suite of debt dispute tools and they're just easy to use apps, right? So you go in there and depending on what kind of debt you want to dispute or if you want to dispute a line item in your credit score or something, right? So it's a way of giving people something for free. They're completely free. We do trainings in them at all, all the time at other organizations so that they can then train their folks and bring them out into their communities, right? With the idea, though, that by providing a form of oftentimes individual mutual aid, that we're also able to bring people into this idea of collective power. So right now in Los Angeles, we're developing a tool um, that will help people stay in their homes when they're served with an eviction notice once all these moratoria lift, right? Another process, answering an unlawful detainer, a summons and complaint, unlawful detainer, impossible. You have five days to respond to these completely complex um, documents that are often not in your language. Sometimes people with a lawyer get through, but if you don't have a lawyer, forget about it. You have to go down in person and wait in line at a courthouse during, even during regular times, let alone during pandemic times. That legal process is prohibitive, complex, and impossible, right? 
So we have a UD answer tool, an unlawful detainer answer tool that's going to work in Los Angeles County. Hopefully it will work around the country soon enough if we can get some support with the idea that that will allow people to respond to an unlawful detainer, stay in their homes long enough till they get a jury trial in California, which is going to be a long ass time from now because jury trials aren't happening, so that they can get involved in organizing, so that they can get involved in tenant organizing. And this is the last thing I'll say, it's happening in California, but I know we at this webinar everywhere and it's going to happen around the country, I bet is that people's rent debt that they haven't paid since March is being converted into consumer debt, right? So they can no longer be evicted for it, but the landlord can take them to small claims court. So hello, consumer attorney in the chat, right? What we are going to see in this eviction crisis is the even sort of more profound need, not only for tenants unions, which have been doing a fabulous job across the country, but for really understanding rent debt as household debt. They like to call it consumer debt. We reject that language. But how to deal with it when this rent debt across the country is going to turn into consumer debt and how to deal with it collectively so we don't have to lose as individuals in small claims court, but can go as a collective, all of us against the landlord, for example. I do want to tell the consumer attorney in the chat, though, that they we could use them. <laughs> I want to organize you and invite you into this because I, you know, one thing we're trying to do is how do you break down this individualization, right? We all think we have to individually fight the credit bureaus. We have to individually protest our dispute our wage garnishments um, or our tax garnishments, and so the tools are. You know, on the one hand, we want to make a material difference in people's lives, right? If you get, to, if you know, for example, one dispute led to a $800 utility bill not being collected. That's great, right? That's a lot of money, but we are not going to solve this individually by disputing debts and using the legal process. So it's about doing, um, coupling that with this kind of radical financial literacy and ultimately getting people into the movement if they're open to that. But there's lots to be done. So join us. Is that your expertise? <laughs> yes. Um, Okay, am I, can, uh, let me see, am I, I want to make sure, you, okay, yeah, can you hear me? Okay, so, yes, that's great. Okay, uh, other questions. Um, one really good, interesting question, there's two questions I kind of want to take because they're related together. One, could you talk about the strategy of how you decide what kind of debt to focus on in campaigns? You, you know, do you focus on mortgage debt, um, which is held by people with land, you know, by landlords or, or you know, or other things? Um and could you, another question, related question is, is, is organizing against foreclosures more difficult than organizing against landlords, right? So it seems to be the questions about how we choose the strategy. Mm -hmm. Want me to start off with some mortgage stuff? Yeah. What if we actually talk extensively about this in the book. So I'm going to come at it kind of laterally, which is to say this. We always at the Debt Collective talk about a counterfactual, which is to say we talk about something that could have been and wasn't, which is, what if in 2008, right, as this mortgage crisis is starting to spool and unfold, there had already been a mortgage debtors union, right? And so people started reaching out to their union reps and said, hey, my payment is ballooning and I wasn't expecting that and I can't make that payment. Or people were saying, ooh, I'm in over my head and now this, you know, the, the price, I'm underwater, right? So the price of my house is going down and my mortgage is worth more and this doesn't seem like a good investment anymore. I should probably get out. But they're, they're bringing this to their union reps. There are union reps all across the country. Bing, 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 right? And let's be serious about it. It is disproportionately coming from black and Latinx families because those families were disproportionately swindled into the subprime loans that exploded in this way, right? There is then a moment for the union, for the debtors union, the mortgage holders union in that case, to then go to the government, to go to the banks and say, okay, let's negotiate. This many million people are about to default on their mortgages. Bail them out or you're fucked, right? The banks have a union. It is called their lobbyists. It is called the government, right? The government is basically a lobby for the banks, right? Or a union for the banks. Debtors need a union so that in situations like that, we can make demands on the banks. The banks need to take a huge haircut and the mortgage holders need to be bailed out because what happened, because that counterfactual wasn't true, African-American families lost 50% of collective wealth, household wealth in the wake of 2008. Latinx families, 
of collective wealth in that over that last decade, right? Horrific outcomes. So people are asking, and rightly so, about the kind of class aspects of home ownership, right? Like, what does it mean to organize a mortgage holders union? Like, aren't you just really like lobbying for landlords? And sure, there are some people who use their properties to rent them out, right? Now we're in a very different kind of housing crisis, and there are different things at stake. So right now, one of the things that happened, I'm so sorry, I'll, st I'll stop about this in a minute. But one of the things that happened in the wake of 2008, as we know, is that large private equity firms and huge corporate landlords took advantage of the fact that all of those black and Latinx families lost their homes and boop, 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 bought them up and turned them into rental portfolios, right? So now some of the largest landlords in our country are private equity holders, right? Do we want to take down those landlords? Yes, we do. Yes, we do want to take them down. And yes, we will, if I am in my most optimistic and kind of seeing the horizon moment. But are there other opportunities for cross-class solidarity in this current eviction crisis, for example? Might there be some mom and pop landlords in certain places who are not paying their mortgages, right, because their renters aren't paying their bills, who might want to negotiate something with their tenants where their property gets taken off of the speculative market and gets turned into a community land trust, and they take a below market price, but they get a tax write-off, right? I could imagine some campaigns like that where there were landlords who agreed. So I do think that in this particular moment, the 2020 moment of the eviction crisis, I think there are some very interesting um, potential alliances between the much smaller landlords who were certainly in the California legislation that recently passed, they were sold out by the corporate landlords. And there is also a huge opportunity to take back that property from those corporate landlords who bought it all up in the wake of the 2008 crisis. So that's just some of the mortgage rent landscape yeah i think so one this is i love how excited hannah gets at the idea of taking the banks and the housing issue i mean just to sort of underscore two things she made and then get uh go in a different direction i mean one is obama had the hamp program which i think was the home affordable Mo mortgage program or protection or something it's a program that was supposed to write down mortgages for four million households and it, there was all this money sitting there under a Democratic administration, and only one million families got access to that. So to me, that's something where this imaginary mortgage union could have, you know, somebody should have organized and said, that money's there. There's no laws that have to be written. Nothing needs to be done. You need to just freaking distribute it, right? We're entitled to that. That could have helped three million families, right? And prevent them from losing their homes, losing their assets, you know, losing that, that wealth that, that Hannah spoke of. I think there's also, you know, when we say, well, we want to be practical, we want to win. I mean, I think one thing that strikes me about 2008 is, you know, the real solution was off the table, which is like, our home shouldn't be a commodity, right? Our, we shouldn't have to live in a speculative asset and be like, I bought this house, I hope it grows up in value so I can actually retire, you know, and, and, you know, have a decent old age. <laughs> it's like, well, what if your house was just a house? And the value is that you could live in it, you know? I mean, this is what social housing is. It's like, you know, this whole this whole idea that everyone has to buy a house that goes up and up in value is um, just needs to be questioned. And the solution to this crisis is social housing. It's housing as a, as a public good, right? And now we, you know, we have made progress in that and that a homes guarantee is on the agenda. And I think, but I think pushing the public imagination is part of our goal. And that's a very David Graeberism, right? That, one of the tools we have as the left is to expand the imagination. That's can I, what I yeah, can I, yeah. Can I just jump in and say, you know, I think there's also, you know, since we're on housing, just briefly, um, I want to say that, like, you know, there's a there's a discourse, you know, and I'm writing about this a little bit, and and about buying back the hood in the black community, um, mm -hmm. that somehow, you know, just sort mm -hmm. of re making landlords also, you know, getting more black landlords is going to be the solution, uh, especially if they're like combinations of very wealthy celebrities and wealthy developers you know but i think like and you know there's all kinds of you know rappers love to talk about buying back the hood but if you listen to like even if you listen to like jay-z you listen to 444 he talks about you know in this line that sort of you know maybe is flirting with anti-semitism i don't know it's, it's an interesting line but he basically says you know a, 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 an empowerment strategy that you know people use to sort of own a lot of property in new york he just says credit so it's like oh so so debt is the thing that's going to rescue us more debt right and you see actually that like you know 
this is sometimes put on the table that somehow credit or you know entrepreneurship in the landlord space is actually the thing. So the very mechanism that oppress already oppressing black people is imagined that when it has a black face on it, right, it's gonna it's gonna rescue us. But of course, um, what this does is it erases the backdrop of other strategies, right, and constraints that you were talking about in Oakland. We saw that you know there was a movement where some folks took back some property, right? But, but and I think that to the points that you all are making here and in this book, the thing that made that work, it wasn't simply the fact that you know it was narrated. The, the the narrative was around these two these mothers, right? And that was really powerful. But it was the movement that built up around them, right? And the larger the way that there was a light shined on that because initially the people who owned that property tried to offer them, they said, well, we'll just, if you just leave, we'll just pay you like one month's rent and then you'll get out and it'll be happy. And because there was a movement behind them, they were able to reject those terms and say, no, this is, this is what this is about. So I think that, I, I, I think that's really important to keep those possibilities and expand into new imaginations of what can happen. Um, just to look at, let me see if we have any more questions here. Oh, we have one great question here. What was an A credit score before the Great Recession became a C? Um, what was an A credit score before the Great Recession became a C credit score after the bottom fell out? Um, how do we get rid of the, the credit rating system? Yeah, I mean, we talk a little bit about this. Um, I mean, the word for the word credit means trust. I mean, I think it's really interesting how the banking sector takes all these words like mutual funds, right, or bonds, right, which implies like a bond between people, and credit's one of those terms. Um, I think they have this, I think we have this in the book, actually, which is, you know, right now, your credit score is all about the supposed risk you are to the lender. So it's all from the lender's perspective. And as Hannah said, it's really untransparent. The book has a lot about this. It talks about how these credit scores used to be totally unregulated. They were like a wild west of just all this personal data about you and your habits. In the 70s, there's more consumer protections. You suddenly, you know, you have the right to dispute it. It's the unfair system we're accustomed to. It's a system with a lot of, um, uh, with you know, that's really insidious and terrible. But there's some consumer protections. And as a detail, as like the digital chapter details in the book, we're now moving into this world of consumer scoring online that's a total unregulated space and has really um, uh, nefarious and worrisome implications, right? Because we're being scored all the time by these entities we can't see and we have no right to dispute what they're saying. So, I mean, I think we need to politicize them. We're still at that level. We're still at the level where we need to say, like, this is, like, this is a, a system human beings have made. It's not natural. It doesn't have to be this way. And, um, and you know, it's a form of social control. And, and you know, your credit score shouldn't determine um, whether you can get a job or get, you know, have housing and, you know, whether you can build a better life. Um, I think we need to proactively look at the future and worry about these digital transformations because it's, it's actually right now the trends are just getting worse. And then I think the flip side we say in the book is, well, but what kind of credit scoring would we want? I mean, we want the risk of fossil fuel investments to be properly ranked and rated, you know? I mean, you know, and give them like a triple F. Instead, what we've seen in the economic response with COVID, with all this corporate debt relief I was talking about, we've basically seen the Fed step in and buy junk debt, a lot of which, the majority of which is from the energy sector, right? So the dying fossil fuel sector that's killing the planet, suddenly, you know, boosting, increasing the value of their junk debt. Um, and then, uh, yeah, offering, you know, more punitive stringent terms to municipalities and offering nothing to, you know, regular, regular debtors. So the whole system, you know, needs to be abolished in the sense we're talking about, dismantled and reimagined so that we think, well, what are the actual risks? You know, what are things, things are risky. Um, and we should be taking stock of those things. We're just measuring all of the wrong factors at the moment. Profitability it should not be like the guiding principle of risk assessment. It's just totally destructive. <laughs> Absolutely. Anna said, you know, lots of forms of risk out there. White supremacy is risky, right? Fossil fuels are, are, are risky. So, you know, listen, there is, we, we, I think we, I think we've, begun to touch on some of the, the, the scale, you can see the sort of the iceberg that's underneath here. So I just want to, you know, thank everybody for watching. 
a few concrete things I just want to address before we close out is can we just state again what the what the where people can go for actual links, you know, to, to, to connect to this movement? Yes, you can find us at debtcollective.org. So debt, D-E-B-T, collective, all one word, debtcollective.org. And from there, you can get linked out to all of the various ways to plug in. Um, and for the book, it would be right here on the Haymarket website. So if you just put can't pay, won't pay, if you just Google can't pay, won't pay, you'll find the book. And it is free right now. The ebook is free between now and a couple weeks from now. So thank you so much to Haymarket, not only for publishing this, but also, you know, giving it out for free as an ebook. So um, check that out too, please. Yeah, y'all trying to say free books. Come on. You know, the, let the warm feelings of free books from Haymarket and books that, you know, and so that means we got to support them. And, and, and get some books as well. Um, and let me just also remind, again, next Tuesday, September 29th, 5 p.m., Abolition, Intersectionality, and Care. Wednesday, September 30th, Black Power Afterlives from the Black Panther Party to Black Lives Matter. You know you don't want to miss that. And uh, thank you so much to Hannah, to, um, to um, Astra, and to John, and all the people behind the scenes, to the person doing captions for us, and to all of you. And everybody out there who's, who's on the streets, if you're on the streets um, for Breonna Taylor, I would say, you know, make sure you wear your mask, keep yourself hydrated, you know, you know, they're going to do violence to us. And let's, let's not do violence to ourselves out there. And everybody hold your head up and let's take care. All right. All right, y'all. Thank you so much, Chandra. Thank you.